is um, Shiwan Zhang, who is a PhD student at MIT, and he did uh, work at Google Brain. And the paper is called Understanding Deep Learning Requires Rethinking Generalization. And as you know, it's a paper that got the, one of the best paper awards. And so here on behalf of the program committee, Jiwang, you have a, like, the award. OK, so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about understanding the generalization behavior in the region of deep learning. Um, this is collaborative work with uh, Sammy, Maurice, Ben, and Oriel. And our poster is Wednesday morning. Um, so we're going to talk about generalization. According to Ben, or according to the conventional wisdom in machine learning, um, if you want to get the best generalization performance, what you want, usually want to do is to choose the right model complexity according to the amount of data you have at hand. So basically, you don't want to choose a model that is too simple so that it cannot fit any interesting patterns in your data. But on the other hand, you don't want to choose your model that is too complicated because when uh, the model is too complicated, you, the training and test errors start to diverge and you are in the region of overfitting and you will have a poor generalization error. However, there are some fields that overparameterized models are actually very popular and uh, successful. For example, if I ask you what the purple dots are in this picture, it might be very difficult for, for me or for many of people here to, to get the answer, but for experts in this particular field, they might be able to immediately get that it's a water snake. The fact is, um, when trying to interpret the structures and patterns of the stars in the sky, people use a lot of imagination and creativity. They, they create this kind of beautiful pictures and structures out of just a few dots, and those dots are actually mixed with many other dots in the sky. And of course, the other regime where overparameterized models are used a lot is deep learning, as you, uh, all of you are very familiar with. For example, if you look at the um, Typical models in, used in computer vision, such as Inception, uh, VGG, ResNet, all of them have at least one order of magnitude more parameters than training data uh, they're applied to. And if you go back to the, the BIOS variance plot, and you see that deep learning is here. Ben has already showed this plot, uh, the, the ver animation, but I really want to show this again, because I think this really is weird. Um, the weird thing is happening here that we're in this regime where you have extremely high variance, but on the other hand, in practice, you know that deep learning works very well and it generalizes very well and outperforming all the conventional models. An even weirder thing is that if you also, uh, what Ben has also mentioned is, if you look at the, the amount of overparameterization, if you uh, compute number of parameters over the number of training samples, it could happen that when this p over n grows, your error actually can go down sometimes. For example, this is a simple experiment I did on CIFAR 10. Uh, if you feed a multi-layer perception with only one hidden layer, it's already 20, 20 times more parameter than the number of training data. And you get 50% error, which is not maybe not great. And then you can do a, a larger model, LXNet, uh, around 30 times more parameters and the error goes down, and you can keep this process. You move to inception, the error keeps going down, and you, you, you go to a variant of ResNet, which roughly have 200 times um, more parameters than training that you, you get the minimum, uh, the, uh, the best accuracy here. So this seems to be suggesting that measuring the, counting the number of parameters is not a very useful way of measuring the complexity of the model, uh, of course, the architecture goes into play in this picture, but I mean, if counting the number of parameters is not the right thing to do, then what, how can we measure the effective complexity of a model, right? Um, so in order to do that, let me introduce the randomization test. Before I, I show you the detailed randomization test, I just want to show this punchline first. Basically, we found that um, deep neural network can easily fit random labels. So 
what exactly is the randomization test? It, it's just a, a set of simple experiments that is designed to measure, to, to try to fit to random noise or uh, data that does not contain meaningful structures or patterns to learn from and so that you can measure the, the effective cap capacity of your models. Uh, in particular, here we, we consider an experiment with random labels. Basically, what we do is to take an existing standard benchmark data set, such as CIVAR10 or ImageNet, and then we take the labels, we flip a K-sided dice for each of the images in your data set. The K, here, K equals to the original number of classes in the data set. And what we do is to just assign a new label according to the, new, uh, the dice flipped and remove, uh, forget about the, the old labels. So each image is uh, assigned a new label completely independently. For example, here you might have flowers that um, originally belongs to the same class, but in the new data set, uh, they could have diff completely different classes, and they could be visually very similar. So um, with this random label data, that data set, what we do is we, we basically go online and Google successful models uh, on CIFAR10 and ImageNet, and, and we take the open source imp implementations of those models and port them to TensorFlow. What we do is we take exactly the same architecture, exactly the same hyperparameter configuration and uh, uh, learning rate scheduling, and then we let the tensor flows into the original CIFAR data set and then flows into the random data set, and then we compare the, the result. So here is the result on CIFAR 10. On the far left, you see uh, no label noise, which means the original CIFAR data set, and then on the far right are the uh, full label noise data set. So basically what we do here is um, um, we have a smooth interpolation of the ratio of the the label being corrupted. Um, what you see here is the training error, which peop uh, many people usually don't look at. Uh, the, the result we found is that regardless of whether you have any structure or patterns, like from the original CIFAR data set, which has structure, to the completely noise data set, you, which, in which you don't have any structures, you can fit 100% training error regardless of this. But if you look at the test error with a continuously increasing ratio of a label being replaced with noise, the test error, of course, continues to decay until you, it reaches chance, which is 10% 10, 10 in the full label noise. So this basically creates a full generalization gap, and you see a wild difference in the generalization error between the two extreme cases. And this is with exactly the same architecture, the same algorithm, and the same hyperparameter setup being used. And this is definitely um, weird. And this goes to our punchline again. Uh, basically, we found that deep neural network could easily fit random labels. And the implication is that basically arbitrary training set you give it, it could ineffectively memorize the whole training set, regardless of whether there's anything to learn uh, or it's completely noise. And what, what I want to mention here is that um, we're not trying to make a universal statement. We're not saying that any neural network inevitably fit arbitrary uh, random noises, because it, it's definitely true that there are models that cannot fit, cannot overfit uh, um, random labels, but the, the point here is that there are successful models with the same architecture and same models. On the one hand, it can fit natural CIFAR or, or ImageNet. Uh, I should mention that the result, the similar result here can be observed on ImageNet and with other architectures, including multi-layer perception and uh, LXNet and things like that. So basically the point is that with the same architecture, there are successful models that can um, basically have very different behavior and uh, the, it has wild different generalization error and this is creating a puzzle uh, in the conventional wisdom of, of the argument about generalization. But there's the one caveat that also Ben also mentioned here. It's about regularizer. We all know that um, regularizers are designed to actually constrain the, the hypothesis space that you're actually using so basically, you could have an enormously huge hypothesis, 
but space. But when you add regularizer, you could actually reduce the hypothesis space to be a smaller one. And this might be able to actually constrain your hypothesis space so that the constraint space is not so wired, it cannot fit random label, right? Uh, so this is what we do here. We go back to the, um, we go back to the experiment. We add regularizers that are commonly used in deep learning. Basically, there are three um, regularizers that are very common. One is data augmentation. The other is weight decay, which is extremely popular, not because it's uh, super powerful, but mostly because many of the toolkit applied by default. And then there's the dropout, uh, which was popular, but yeah, uh, nowadays kind of replaced by, by batch normalization. What we do is um, we go back to the experiment and look at how this, the network performs with or without regularizers. And this is uh, on the original, uh, the, the result I showed you before on CIFAR 10 without regularizer. Now we add back regularizers. There are two observations. One is adding back regularizers, it still fits 100%, with 100% accuracy. And the other observation is that the test accuracy improves. But it, it improves a bit. It's not like a fundamental uh, change here. The same thing um, happens on ImageNet. Uh, you, you get improvement in the test accuracy, but it's not like fundamental thing. Um, What's even more is that you can actually, we can actually go to the randomization task and ask if I add back regularizers, is it still able to fit random noise, right? If it fits random noise, then the, the model space is still huge. And the fact is that, yes, it, for most of the case, it fits random noise. There are failure cases such as the AlexNet, uh, but again, we're not trying to make universal statement. And it's definitely true if you're continuously increasing the strength of regularizer, there's going to be a point uh, where, when you cannot fit random labels or you cannot even fit natural labels. Um, and then you go to region of underfitting, right? Uh, so this is basically saying the regularizers is not like a fundamentally changing the picture here. But fortunately, there's something that people tend to start calling implicit regularizer, which Ben also uh, mentioned. Basically, some, anything that hurts optimization is kind of, uh, uh, for example, early stopping. You're, you're, you're stopping before you reach the minimizer. Or SGD introduced the gradient noise, or it has stability thing. So for the, because we have limited time, we only look at SGD here. Um, basically, the fact is that SGD has the property it converges to minimum norm, norm solution in linear case, but for nonlinear uh, deep learning, it more complicated here. Basically, all the randomization tests I showed you before are carried on with SGD. You can see that um, it converges slower when you fit SGD with random label, but eventually both of them converge to zero loss here. And what you, you can even do some something else like. You can shuffle the pixels in your picture, and you can still use SGG to fit a common to zero error. Or you can even completely randomly sample your, your pixels in your picture. Or you can even like use Gaussian pixels. And it's still able to fit um, uh, with a zero loss, which converges to the global minimizer. So basically, this is saying SGD or implicit regularizers, I didn't, I didn't talk about other implicit regularizers, but um, we talk about that in the paper and please come to our, our posters. And basically this is saying the implicit regularizers is also not like changing the picture fundamentally. And even with the implicit regularizing, the models you see or you, you actually use in practice has this, this kind of enormous effective capacity. And, understanding the generalization behavior using the bias variance kind of analysis is, seems still difficult. And this, this is um, kind of a side observation in um, this, our experiment, which is not the main point, but I think I wanted still to show you, you this, and Ben also mentioned this. It, it seems that, like optimization in the region of deep learning is um, kind of easy, or I should say, from uh, different ways, like the, the source of difficulties of optimization seems to be different from the source of difficulty of generaliza generalization. So learning and optimization, they could be difficult 
in different ways, and this does not necessarily correlate with each other. Um, so with that, I'm going to conclude here. Basically, what we do here is to, uh, we introduce a simple um, experiment framework that measure the effective capacity of deep neural network and deep learning models. And we found that many successful deep, deep, deep nets can shatter the, the whole training set. And we propose uh, that in order to fully understand in this particular regime the generalization behavior, one need to have a formal measure of complexity that takes into consideration both the model, the algorithm, and the task or data distribution into consideration, it's such as like the, the margin framework basically assume you have, like if you have large margin in the data distribution at hand, then you might be able to generalize better. Uh, so in this kind of flavor. And our poster is on Wednesday morning. Please come to our poster if you have uh, other questions. And thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Nice, very nice talk. Um, there's, is there any questions there? Um, so that's a good point. Early stopping helps a bit. Let me see if I have the. Um, it might be complicated because the uh, the video system here. I have a back backup slide. So basically, early stopping could help in some case, um, but it's it's kind of even in the natural label case. You can see in some case early stopping. Like f we did the experiment on CFR10 and ImageNet. Um, on CFR10, early stopping doesn't really change the behavior very much. And on ImageNet, uh, early stopping on natural label does, um, does improve the performance a little bit, but there's not a significant like fundamental gap there. And if you are arguing about early stopping will prevent you from fitting random labels because of the convergence uh, curve you see there, that's a, that's a valid argument, but again, this argument is the same as saying regularizer or explicit regularizer is, is helping you to do this because if you keep adding the, increasing the size, the strength, the value of the regularizer coefficient, there is going to be at a point where you are no, no longer able to fit random labels. But that does not um, say, does not explain why there are models or there are cases where like if you run the same number of epochs with the same strengths of regularizers, you can fit random label in one case, and you cannot. Uh, you can fit natural label and have good generalization error in the other case. Thank you. Okay. Thank so you. You, you have uh, tested convnets on uh, image recognition problems. Yes. Uh, but there are other architectures which may be harder to optimize. I'm thinking of things like neural training machines and you know models trained on huge quantities of data, like for machine translation. These are much harder to train. Yeah. So do you think that your conclusions carry over to these different kinds of architectures and tasks? Um, so are you talking about the conclusion that optimization is easy? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that might not directly carry to. Actually, optimization is easy only when some other people go there and find out the right parameter, hyperparameter setting. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I hope this answers your question. <laughs> okay, with that, let's thank uh, Qingguan again.